Hello, hello. Let's see. How's it going, everyone? I think I have this working. All kinds of technical problems trying to get this stream started, but I think everything appears to be working now. Um, if anyone's watching, uh, some people are watching, let me know in the chat if you can't hear me, if you can't see me, whatever it may be. Um, it looks like I do have it going, but yeah, one of those nights where everything just felt like a struggle. Looks like the audio is a little hot. And again, so if you haven't been here before, this is why I do these live streams. Hey, what's up, Alan? Is I'm trying to figure out how to do them well so that it's a service that I could end up offering for my clients, um, being able to figure out how to live stream. So tonight was one of those things where I tried to do a bunch of new things at about 8 o'clock and everything was going wrong. And so I was like, man, I put my 10-minute countdown timer on and I didn't even know if I was going to, I'm like, Phew. I might not even get there. But yeah, as I was saying, um, oh, see, things are not going right. You cannot see that. I don't know why. Or I can't see it. So, Let's see if I can get this working. Oh, there we go. Well, it's a miracle I even made it on because I really thought things were going horrible. But yeah, influenced by the YouTuber Terry Berenson during lockdown, he started doing a live stream almost every single morning and uh, kind of formed a cool community around it and all that kind of thing. But more importantly, he said how he started to get clients from learning how to live stream really well on his YouTube channel. So I figured, you know what, if someone asked me if I could live stream, I want to be able to say yes. So kind of taking a cue or uh, an idea from Terry and so I'm trying to live stream uh, twice a week you know I did it for a couple weeks and then I was just too busy and now I'm trying to get back at it Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 uh, I'm talking about photography talking about bikes uh, sound just got weird and let's see bouncing showing normal let me double check all my connections oh it's your phone <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah so yeah, just uh, basically to teach myself how to do it, I try and add like a new element every week. This week I tried to add my GoPro as a second camera and boy was that a nightmare. I know they've had it like figured out for Mac for a while and when I tried to do it, it downloaded a .pkg file which I've never seen in my computer when open. When I tried to open it then using apps it was like suggesting all these third party apps which I just kind of ran out of time to actually research real well tonight. So then I went and I realized that that was a Mac file and that's why it wasn't working. So I went to Windows. GoPro sends you to a Windows Facebook group to get the download, which is just really weird. And I went and it said the group was closed and not accepting members. I got to a site, tried to download something. That wouldn't work either. So one camera tonight, because I do want to figure out if I could run two cameras driven by software. Um, I know people buy like interfaces to camera switch and camera encode and all that kind of stuff. I kind of wanted to see if my desktop could run my 5D Mark IV, which I'm filming this on now, and my GoPro, so I can kind of have a top-down view if I want to have things on my desk here. But, yep, that'll have to wait till, uh, I would say Thursday, but I don't think I'm going to have time to live stream this Thursday. I have a dinner, a business dinner at 6. Um, I'm hoping I get home in time to get this set up and maybe I'll set it up before I leave and hopefully then I could try and figure out what was up with the GoPro thing and all that but trying to do it an hour before I was going to go live was not enough time. But yeah and then I had trouble with my Canon. EOS Utility um, is what recognizes it even when I came on it wasn't showing up. I tried to make a new thumbnail for this and plugged in my other camera. And then my Canon software switched between the two cameras and it just the whole thing where I'm like, yes, I need to plan a little farther ahead for this kind of thing and not just totally wing it at the last second if I'm going to actually learn anything from what I'm doing here. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's where I'm at. It's a little stressed to start off to try and just pull this off and see if I could do it. And I did get it going. Is this Canon going to focus? There we go. I've been, so I have been using the new Canon all week and have a little more um, experience with it. Uh, right off the bat, I loved the files that came off it, but um, I was a little, like, I was getting a little 
flustered with the way the controls have become so different. They're familiar if you're used to Canon, you know what I mean? The back of the camera is not that different, but the electronic stuff is so different, like learning how the autofocus works, which can be really awesome, but it can also be frustrating if you don't have it set up for your particular situation right. Um, so yeah, finally got some custom functions set up. I, one thing I really miss is just the physical switching between video and um, still photography. On the 5D4, you know, you have the you have a switch, you know, that just so you always know where you are. And in the center is a it's the record button when it's on video, and it's the um, uh, live view button for you know when you're on stills if you want to look at the back of the camera and see stuff through the you know the digital sensor. I really miss that. Now you just have this mode button, which is fine, but it's a double press to get the video. So it's mode and then info, which I just think is un. It's the one thing I so far haven't liked about the physical controls. Like I said, a lot of things were confusing, but they're starting to fall into place. And I did shoot a video this weekend with it, and the the autofocus is so brilliant. It makes it so much more fun to use than even this camera. As you see, once in a while, I do lose focus on this. That new EOS, EOS R5 just it does not lose focus on a face. I mean, I was even shooting photos of um, at a bonfire the other night with barely any light, and it was um, absolutely brilliant. I think I, let's see. Oh, do I have them on here? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, image here, this is, where am I? Let's see what my settings come up as. If I can get them back. Hello. No pause left in there. ISO 2000 F4 160. Yeah, and it was just able to lock on so well. You know, not super noisy. I almost feel like the blur is just from the uh, kit lens that I have on the camera. It's a um, 24 to 105 F4. It's an L lens, but I'm used to prime lenses, which are just so sharp that as I look at these files and see all this rich detail with the R5, the only thing I'm noticing is that the lenses I the traditional EF mount lenses that I have just are better lenses and I haven't bought the adapter yet um, which I need to do they have a few out there and I want to do some research and there were some rumors of a few more coming out so I kind of held off for a little while anyways when I went live um, that's the intro <laughs> when I went live last week I tried something new I used my laptop and I actually developed a role of Kodak Tri-X um, so I was thinking maybe today I would actually show those photos since I did develop them. And we could talk about cycling if anyone in the chat wants to talk about anything, ask any kind of question, we could do that too. Um, the Giro was actually has been interesting, but now two teams have pulled out because of COVID and the whole thing is thrown into question. I wonder if they will make it all the way to the end. Um, today, Sagan won his first race in over a year, which is insane that he hasn't won in that long. I was kind of excited to see him win. Um, went solo, went in the break and went solo. And there was, it was fairly climby. And that's, I think that's one thing, I know some people don't like Sagan, um, but one thing I like about him is compared to the other sprinters, this dude can actually climb, which is one thing that I've always thought makes him a little more excited, exciting than other riders, other sprinters. But yeah, with the um, seeing him win today and then the news that Perry Roubaix got canceled, um, me and Aaron were actually went to the Perry Roubaix that Peter Sagan won and we're in the velodrome when he came around and he was right in front of us. Actually, a photo they used for the banner on the Facebook for um, Perry Roubaix's page for a long time had me and Aaron in the background, me holding my camera and my hand up cheering and stuff. So it was pretty cool. I wonder if I, I think I could probably actually find that yeah, Flickr. I type in Roubaix and Road Apple Roubaix comes up a gravel race we did
Oh yeah, so these are some photos I took in the Arenberg Forest. That bag next year, yeah, how was that? Did you, I didn't see you post any photos of that yet. Was that Friday, last Friday, or is it this Friday? Yeah, that's actually uh, Taylor Finney there, even though I completely misfocused and only focused on the, um, <laughs> the dudes standing across the way. Those are all the people who were on the bus with us. There's Sagan, yeah. Again, total misfocus. But it was so exciting. and the, I was more trying to watch the race. You know, the cyclists were passing by, and I was just kind of letting the camera, like, rip off shots. Aaron actually held my GoPro and got some... The video is better than the photos, but yeah, that's Sagan on his way to win Perry Roubaix. And he was the first rider to win in the World Championship. Oh, it's in two weeks. Oh, okay. I was thinking it was the Friday we were chatting, talking to uh, Ben from Columbus. I must have misread that message. Hmm. It's in two weeks, so... Yeah, and then Ben and so Ben and Otis at the bike shop, not Columbus Ben, when I asked them about that, if they knew about it, they were bringing up that cyclist that must host it, who I somehow don't follow, and they were saying is one of the most popular like gravel riders on social media, Instagram, and stuff like that. Can't think of his name now. You could help me out. Uh, yeah, it looked interesting. It looks like... Oh yeah, look at how brutal those cobbles would be. I think it's especially those guys are mostly still riding on some put on twenty eights for Roubaix, but twenty fives. But apparently, we still have Flanders this weekend. Um, uh, the presentation at the beginning, Taylor Finney, Aaron. That was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, the EF cars. They were using Teslas. Ultra Romance, yes. Ultra Romance, yeah. Yeah, they showed me a bunch of videos and then I started following them. But yeah, I was completely, I don't know how, but completely unfamiliar for some reason with Ultra Romance, which it seems like in any kind of cycling scene, especially the gravel scene, everyone seems to know them, but I did not somehow. Bike touring extraordinaire. Yeah, where where was the lo that website too? Like it was like a web 1.0 website with the link you sent me, Ben. And I was like, I'm trying to figure out all the details, and that's probably why I got the date wrong. It is not a modern looking, you know, site. It's like very text um, and kind of sarcastic written. And I was trying to figure out the details, and I hard had a hard time doing it. Oh, yeah, this is my photo of one Sagan, one Roubaix. Kind of cool. We're way too far away. It's heavily cropped in. I don't have, yeah, I'm not a sports photographer, so I don't have super long lenses. And not that I would have flown to France with one anyways. You know, I was going to be on vacation, but it's not like I'm not going to pull out my camera and get a shot like that. Nothing he does is modern and serious, but he's crazy successful. Yeah. Nothing I do is modern except my photography, and I'm crazy middling. <laughs> yeah, I guess my I do have my modern camera, bikes wise. You know, nothing modern. My most modern bike is my 2014 Tamland Two. Oh, a crit racer back in the day, huh? Yeah, I need to look into it. Look into it more. It seems like I'm missing a piece of something that's pretty cool in our scene, you know. Drinking a uh, Columbus IPA. I went over, and all the fall beers were the really sweet pumpkiny ones. I was looking for an Oktoberfest; they're already gone. And then they had a bunch of stones that were seventeen dollars for a six pack. And it's not that I won't pay for a. You know, some good beer here and there, but 
just didn't feel like I needed to buy a $17 six pack for a, I don't know. Uh, on a Sunday, I think I might try and take my TV, which is right here. This is why I wanted a second camera so I could pan around and show everything. But it runs on, you know, it's a Wi-Fi. I don't even have, um, you know, I don't have traditional cable. I just watch YouTube and cycling. Take it out back of the studio and I have a fire pit out there. And I was hoping we could have a little party and watch Flanders, like a socially distant um, party. A couple years ago, I had a Roubaix party. Obviously, that didn't happen this year. And that's when we could still all get together, had a bunch of French breakfast. And it was a real blast to sit around and actually watch, like, bike racing with a bunch of people. We had, you know, it's so early in the morning that we did Bloody Marys and stuff like that. Um, so I was thinking, um, yeah, how can I do something like that for Flanders? And so I think, yeah, TV out back. There's a slight chance of rain, but some of my friends do farmer's markets. So I was thinking maybe I could get a couple tents. So maybe I could still somehow have the fire going so it's a little warm enough and have the TV up on the, um, I built a little back, like balcony out back. It's like a set of what, six steps down to ground level. So I was thinking I'd prop the TV up, have it covered, and we could sit out there in the back parking lot. It's an alleyway, you know, like a, city alleyway but Flanders is I mean I couldn't even I mean I'll, getting to see Perry Roubaix was awesome but Roubaix and Flanders are my two favorite bike races they're just both the coolest so Let's see yeah like I said earlier I'm just relieved that I was able to pull off trying to figure out this stream because it was a disaster trying to start it off yeah, my garden is still going. My garden's still going. A lot of pepper's still going, but the um, tomatoes are completely blighted out. Um, I actually planted a fa fall garden that my girlfriend, Erin, uh, started um, broccoli, cauliflower, and kohlrabi. And I planted a bunch of that in there. I, unless the October is great all the way till the end, I don't think anything will make it. Uh, maybe the kohlrabi will be big enough to pick. Uh, this rain we just had helped a little bit but yeah it's still going still a bunch of peppers out there still a bunch of herbs out there um but yeah my tomatoes just blighted out really bad this year i don't know why um usually i grow tomatoes like weeds i mean they'll be last year they must have been eight feet tall going over the fence falling everywhere every year back there you know my cu my cucumbers blighted out really early this year i got one round and then they had some kind of downy or powdery mildew all over them and those blighted out, and that kind of took some of my squash with it. I do have some white pumpkins growing out there that came out of my compost pile because I um, composted white pumpkins last year, so it's kind of cool. They're like about this big right now. I never know what they are either. It's like, are they the gordy, tiny ones, or is it actually going to grow into like a big white pumpkin? But yeah, and I, you said your tomatoes weren't very good either, and I talked to a couple friends who said the same thing. I, so maybe it was a year. My girlfriend was saying that I should plant some cover crops. I've grown in the same garden now for five years. So there's probably, you know, when I started using it, it had been weeds for 20 years and it was very rich from the weeds growing and dying off. And so now I'm wondering if, yeah, I need to do some soil amendments, some, you know, but yeah, 2020. If, if there's ever a year where something as simple as tomatoes aren't gonna grow, especially I've got pretty bright sun back there, this would be the year, but Enough to always, when I wanted them, and make a sauce or cut some fresh for a salad, I had them. But, like, usually I'd be freezing them or walking them down to the tattoo shop next door and giving them tomatoes and giving my tenants upstairs tomatoes. But, yeah, just really weird. Um, and I grew, it wasn't a varietal thing because I grew probably five, six different kinds of tomatoes. So, but, yeah, I've never had luck with peppers, though. So I just wondered what the deal with that was. And. I was just having a beer downtown with my friend Greg, and he said the same thing, that he's never been in his garden, pretty shaded. But he said he never had luck with peppers, but was able to grow peppers this year. So I don't know. Strange. And that's why, that's kind of why I love gardening. It's not because you're going to, I don't know, it's because you never know what's going to happen, and you kind of learn as you go. I'm wondering if I, I don't know if I even took any peak. I don't think I took any good photos of the garden this year, even when it was up and running. Um, no, 
Turns out I tag a lot of things garden on Flickr. Flickr is a website that people used to put their photos on back in the day. <laughs> There's no photos of my current garden at all in here. Let's see how I'm searching. Day taken. I think that's the thing with the garden too, when it starts growing and starts, that's when you want to take a lot of photos, you're like, oh, it's so cool. And then as the season goes on, you're just kind of, for me, I'm always out riding my bike and then the garden is something when I get home, I like kind of take care of, or when I'm for dinner, I go out and pull some weeds and, um, this, this is the time I thought a, when I had my house, I actually thought I was planting a cucumber plant by the, I, mean, I must've mixed them up. And I accidentally, so I thought they were climbing cucumbers, so I put them up a trellis, and it turned out they were giant white pumpkins. So I had giant white pumpkins hanging from a uh, <laughs> trellis-type thing one year. And then when they got too heavy, that's when I just picked them. Yeah, I was looking, at, I, don't, I guess I don't really have any wide shots of my little alley garden. Now oh, there's one from a couple years ago. Yeah, so this fence has since re been replaced by this white fence, which when I walk out my back door is blinding. I actually like this rundown. As a photographer, I love this little rundown fence that they used to have back there. But it's there's a neighborhood behind my alley and whoever lived there replaced it. When they replaced that, I lost a lot of my um, perennials too. Um, these strawberries that are here now didn't make it. I planted a new plant in the same spot. And then in the corner, I had a bunch of herbs that would come back every year. And the oregano came, or the thyme came back, but the other stuff didn't. But yeah, it's my little, uh, that's obviously early in the spring from, what's the date on this? Two years ago. So, oh, more than that, July, June 1st, 2016. Yeah, um, maybe I will pull up those photos I took, uh, I finally developed, that I developed live on last Thursday. Yeah, these. This is very kind of a typical, goes with like, saying a 2020 thing. Started this rule of uh, Tri-X in the spring. This is a picture of a... Um, crab apple tree in, tree in bloom with white flowers and snow on it. So I started volunteering at the uh, Countryside's Farmer's Market. They came up with, in the beginning of the pandemic, this cool drive-through system where you pre-ordered and there was minimal people, you know, having to interact. So basically I was a runner and I would go to all the different farmers and get people's orders together. So it was just one person putting them in their trunk. They had a name in their window. They had really cool walkie-talkie sister system that uh, actually my girlfriend came up with. But yeah, since I was so slow then, I was volunteering every weekend, but I would bring my cameras down because I'd have to be there early for setup. And this is one of those shots that I'm like 2020, especially then with the way lockdown was going or whatever we called it, stay at home order in Ohio. It's like, yeah, I'm so slow. I have time to volunteer and do something interesting. And it's like, why can't we just have a nice spring? And that was so frustrating. It's like, if all the years we needed a good spring, that would have been the year. But yeah, I really love that. I, just that photo is great. Um, an Ohio, just such an Ohio thing there, right? Mm -hmm. To have snow on a uh, crab apple tree in, in bloom. Make that a little bigger. I thought I had this spaced out right before I started. Yeah, so along with that, my plan was to... Uh, close up of the flowers. Um, I had a couple projects with analog and I was getting really back into it. Like a couple of my little hobby, like photography things. Uh, did like a big self portrait series where I was kind of dressing up in different kind of 
don't want to say costumes, but kind of like acting in the studio and doing some photos and trying different lighting and then doing my analog thing and had a number of projects I wanted to do with analog. And then that's, I hurt my back in early June so bad that I could barely move for two weeks. I had to use all my friends and family to get me the gigs and just get me moving. But then after that sciatica hit really bad, which was a reaction from me not being able to stretch because my back was so sore. And so it was like, oh, I, sciatica is a good thing is I could ride my bike when my back was bad, I couldn't. But um, sciatica I could, but then when I was off the bike it hurt and um, some more flowers. But yeah, so that was a thing where all these plans and all these other stuff I had been working on kind of went out the window because it was like I just needed to get my job done and then I wanted to go out and ride my bike and that was all, that was everything basically for a while. I needed to sit down and be icing it and off my feet to not be in pain and I was on like an Advil regimen and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of my plans with like sticking with analog kind of went out the window and that's why this stuff is from spring but only finishes um, uh, this month when I finished this role and developed it then on, like I said, live on Thursday. This is a, a remnant in the Cuyahoga Valley which was going to be one of my projects. I wanted to put together a book of all these black and white photos I've shot of like the abandoned Cuyahoga Valley stuff. The stuff that the park never got around to tearing down after they eminent domained everyone's land. Uh, people think the Cuyahoga Valley uh, National Park and the Cuyahoga Valley area between Akron and Cleveland is this old pristine forest, but that's not the, tr the case. The canal went through there and that was the highway of its day and this was the developed area. There's almost no, there's no old growth in the Cuyahoga Valley. It was all farms and structures like this. Here's another, th this was someone's summer cabin. This would have been later, this would have been like you know, bustling 1800s, but so the people who owned some of the farms, it was, you know, like what we think of the country today, people say like, oh yeah, I hang out on my grandma's farm, but they're not growing anything anymore, it's just a um, place where they ride four-wheelers. This would have been kind of more of that era, Cuyahoga Valley. Look at that texture, that is so great, that is such a good, to my own horn, black and white photo. I just, I have Kodak Triax so down the way I want to shoot it and the way I want to develop it. Um, I shoot it with my X700, it's my favorite SLR that I own. Use the red filter to get that contrast, especially when I want it in the sky. And then I develop in Kodak's HC110B. I have some other developers I want to try out, not for Tri-X, but for some other films I've got, because I'm so hooked on HC110, but it's such an active developer, it doesn't necessarily work well for some of the other film stocks I've been trying out lately. This is a, um, actually an 1800s era canal culvert, and it's just under Riverview Road, right by Bath Road, if you happen to be local. Um, and I just think it's really cool, because here you could see it bigger, but that line that you see there, where there's a little arch and then two different sizes. So that first set is from the canal, taking the canal over Bath Creek. The second set of stones is when they increased the height to put the railroad through, and now it's the street that the cars drive down because Riverview pretty much runs down the route of the old canal. And no one sees this. It's right off the towpath trail, but you have to know to come over to the edge and look over and you can climb down the stones on the side and see it. But to me, it's one of those really cool uh, things that exists and right in plain sight, but no one ever goes down to check it out. Sun on some uh, dandelions. This was snow on daffodils. Again, I think probably from that same day at the market. I like the contrast here, even though some of the details being blown out. It's almost, I don't know. Oh, this is over at Aaron's. Um, just, you know, if you're gonna shoot black and white, it's gonna be all about the light. So I just like it's contrast, shadows, all that kind of stuff. Having a beer. Wow, we had a cookout this night. Yeah, Ben was grilling for us. I definitely overexposed that one trying to catch the moment. Brought it down a little bit darker in um, post-processing. I, what I do is I develop and scan the negatives, like I said, like it did on the last live stream, and then I develop the negatives, then I scan them, is what I was trying to say. Hmm. Aaron texted me to let me know my sound is kind of garbly. I've noticed that too, it's very bassy through this my lavalier and into the, um, I'm using the DRX40 as a audio interface. And I need to figure out if I could do something to 
increase the uh, like trouble because usually I just do that in post um, when I'm recording a video. But yeah, with the lavalier, it's been really bassy. It's actually sounded better coming off like one of my shotgun mics. And so I don't know, if maybe this mic after all this time is starting to go bad or if one of my connections is going bad, but I have flipped back and watched some of the live streams and it's just too bassy and um, it doesn't sound very clear. So I try to enunciate when I'm doing this, but uh, anyways. I'm sure in this photo, Brad just said something to offend Aaron and she had just smacked him and that's probably why he's in motion and she's making that face. I have an enlarger. Uh, ben just asked if people still use an enlarger. I do, and the studio actually would have had a really nice um, dark room in the basement, and that's where my enlarger and everything is from. When I used to work for the guy who owned this place, basically I traded work for his like old dark room stuff and took it home. It's funny that I moved back and all the stuff is back in here, but the dark room isn't light tight anymore. We use it as a wood shop. So when I've made prints here, I've actually done it by blacking out my bathroom, but that's such a time consuming process that I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. But yeah. So yeah, but I like making black and white prints. They're, to me, it's the one thing that black and white analog is a worthwhile process. Um, color analog is for fun messing around with film, seeing what they look like, that's cool. But black and white has a real quality to me that digital cannot reproduce because it's actual silver in the paper. And when you do make a darkroom print and you, and not that I'm an expert, but when someone knows what they're doing, they're just beautiful in a way that other things aren't. Even, even when I've done it with my limited skills of dodging and burning, they're just a cool handmade product. So I still think it's a worthwhile process. And also I like the idea of I get to try so many different, well, you could see, you know, like not that I use all these cameras, but I've used a lot of them. And even some of these really old box cameras and stuff like that I mess with. And even this little Italian camera, which didn't even have film counters. And they, you know, very cool stuff. I picked this up at a flea market in Rome and I ran a roll of film through it. And so it's fun to experiment with them and get to try a bunch of different gear because with obviously modern digital, everything costs thousands of dollars. So you can't just be like, unless you're a famous YouTuber, oh, I have some Sonys and Nikons and Canons. But with film, you can. And so this one is a camera that like I got dialed for a specific pur purpose, like Kodak Tri-X, HC110, um, red filter. I know the settings I'm gonna use when I have it for certain lighting conditions. And the way I'm shooting is planning ahead for the way I'm going to develop and then the way I would either scan or make prints. So personally, I think like there's still a value to doing black and white and you do it all on your own and there's, you can manipulate stuff chemically and all that to make it interesting. Um, I've developed my own color, but it's almost pointless because you're only trying to nail what you're supposed to do. So if I do shoot color, like usually it's because I have a bunch of old color film. I'm testing out a new camera. So it, I don't want to test out a new camera in a situation where, you know, it's critical. Like the time we were in Roubaix in Paris, like the Minolta is what I used. I'm not going to use something I haven't used before. But so I'll use color and take it to the lab and see what it looks like. And it's fun to shoot expired film and get that vintage -y look without, you know, dropping Instagram filters on it. Yeah, lots of wasted trash bags went into your, your ghetto, but functional darkroom. Yeah, I take um, like foam core and cover up the windows. But yeah, it's almost, I was almost considering there's a community darkroom that opened up here in Akron and they opened up, of course, right last winter, right before the pandemic. I, they're back functioning again, just with limited space, which has got to be rough for them. But part of me was like, maybe I become a member there. Because even though I have all the equipment and could do it myself, to set everything up, to just... You know, you have to be dedicated to doing a whole, like, eight hours of work or something because to pour out all those chemicals and spend the money on them and, you know, the environmental cost and all that, it's, I don't know, it's hard to justify to do on your own if you're going to be doing it as a hobby, and especially me as I'm already a professional photographer and most of my days already going into um, doing photography. And not that that stops me ever from doing hobby stuff like this right now, but... 
I could see myself, you know, hey, join up if you get it going one night a week and everything's set up for you and I just have to make the print and bring in my paper and bring in my negatives. I don't know. I need to look into what the cost of that would be. So, yeah. When things go back to normal, I'm starting to think if things go back to normal. <laughs> see what, yeah. You know. I I saw one of the what one of the vaccines got uh, the research got stopped and then not that much is going to happen until after the election on anything anyways but yeah it's weird I should make a note to fix this as Aaron called a garbly sound and like I said I've noticed it too but I need to figure out how to set this. I wonder if there's a way to get some trouble into the audio interface or if my streaming software has um, a way to EQ it. I don't see that now, but I'm also always nervous to click on all the stuff when I have a live stream going. Filters, properties, advanced audio properties. Let's see. Yeah, it's showing a lot of stuff I don't understand. Better not to risk it. I still love, you know, though, developing the negatives, especially black and white. I mean, I could still tell by, you know, I've done it enough that I could tell by looking at them what, how well I've done, and then the scans where they come in. But I flatbed scan, at, you know, like 2400 DPI. There's a really nice scanner here at the studio that the software doesn't work anymore, but it's a Nikon scanner, and people go nuts for these things. They buy them for a ton of money now on eBay, and I want to get back into it, and I, I was get into getting that thing to work but uh, I was watching a couple YouTube videos and there's like one part that breaks and there's a company that makes it and it's like $50 but those are super high quality scans from a dedicated scanner I'm like basically what this studio was using before they went digital they went digital by scanning the negatives and getting them to clients and then um, Rick who used to own it told me he had a client who was like if you're not using a digital camera, we're not going to hire you anymore. And that's when he invested and made the jump to Photoshop and digital. So, kind of interesting. Just that's what this place is so cool. It's like this stuff right behind me is all mine, and the cameras here are mine. But there's, I bought the studio with the whole content. So, there's like drawers and like toolboxes that I open up, and I'm like, what is this thing? This is, you know, like, uh, do I have it sitting right here? Or did I? Yeah, this, this, get this, 340 megabyte uh, micro drive. Looks like it's about the size of what a um, CF card would be now, but it actually has moving parts. So it is a, it's not flash. This, And I think Rick told me that this was, you know, I can't remember what price he said, but they paid, you know, hundreds of dollars for this thing, if not a thousand dollars at the time it came out. And now 340 megabytes. Like, what would that be? Probably off my new R5. A couple photos. At the... Slides? Yeah, I have, I have some slides too, yeah. Slides are beautiful, man. Color slides, like, you know, um, some of that Fuji film would just... It was just absolutely beautiful. I, uh, Velvia, Velvia, however you pronounce it, 50 is a slide film that, especially in 120, is just like mind blowing. Photographers used to call it Disney chrome because it's so saturated. They said it looked fake, which is funny now in this world with digital and people overdoing filters. But I actually developed some E6 slide film myself a few times, but same thing like C41 color negatives. You're just trying to nail a development so you're not having any creative leeway with it, but still fun to shoot and scan and see what they look like. I, I did um, fall a couple years ago. I shot with some Velvia, and it's just yeah, absolutely cool-looking, beautiful stuff. But, yeah, you could definitely replicate it all with... I, I really think you could replicate a lot of the color stuff just with digital. As I said, I think black and white still holds up, but... Uh, here we go. This is uh, Velvia. Yeah, 
got some light leaks there. Look how crazy this is. You could see the numbers on the film backing from the camera I was using wasn't light tight. Yeah, one photo on your 5DS, I'm sure. Alan asked if the studio is all, if my building has always been a studio. Do I know any history? Yeah, so where we're standing right now, I don't know what this side was originally. Um, the last thing it was was a real estate office. The guy who ran um, the real estate office out of here owns a lot of the buildings in Cuyahoga Falls, still does, like what's on Main Street or Front Street in Cuyahoga Falls. A lot of the old other 1920s buildings. Um, I believe this was a restaurant and a bar at some point called the Thunderbird. Um, but so my building is two storefronts combined. Um, and the other side was an old school pharmacy that had a soda fountain and everything. That side's really cool. It actually has the original wood floor still. Both sides have most of the original tin ceilings. There's a spot I had to replace where uh, the bathroom and the tenant leaked on the other side. But yeah, so that side was a pharmacy, I think, from the time it opened up into the 70s. And Rick bought that or started renting that building at the other side in the 70s. Um, he bought this side in the early 2000s from the real estate guy because I, when I met him, I was still helping him clean out a bunch of the junk in the basement. Um, just tons of wood and all kinds of stuff that he must have used as his maintenance. Um, his little maintenance thing, but it was a disaster. So now that's where my bike workshop is. So when I do the videos that are like my, you know, where I have the bikes on the bike stands, that's where that is downstairs. Did you, uh, Ben, did you see how low they marked down the 5DS the other day? I think they're selling it for $1,500 now. The 5DS and the 5DR, they marked them both way down and, um, the rumor is that they're about to put out a 80 megapixel version of the R5. And so, yeah, they, I think, yeah, they're done with the DSLRs for sure. I have a really cool, going back to the studio, I found a really cool shot of the outside of this strip of buildings, but I've never been able to find anything inside because I would love to see the old pharmacy. So Rick, who owned it, actually remembers going in there to buy like candy as a kid. Um, yeah, this is Velvia. Just always has that purplish cast in daylight, as you could see there. And, uh, that was a koi dog on the farm. It just started hanging around us for a while. Would never come that close, but just loved to follow us around. Yeah, look at those fall colors. That's where I think the Disney chrome thing comes in. That's the corn picker, obviously, where a four row uh, sweet corn picker, where I used to work at Soleil's in the Valley. Good night, Aaron. Yeah, look at, I mean, look at the trees in the background, the yellows, the old Oliver tractor. Yeah, that looks more manipulated than a digital file, right? And that's just what Fuji slides look like. Yeah, look how look how saturated that is. I would I know and I know I barely edited these. It was basically a straight scan. So Yeah, slide film's cool. I I like all films. I would never tell anyone not to shoot anything. Um like I said just I think there's a real art and a real skill and you're making something handcrafted when you do black and white. And plus slides in a um, C41, it's not permanent. They don't last and the color prints from that stuff fade. Whereas you could now print something with a really nice inkjet and it's gonna be archival, so. Yeah, hot memory card, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, when the what when the five D S R came out, it was the highest megapixel full frame, thirty five you know millimeter style sensor that anyone ever put out. And yeah, now to think that just that it, yeah, I mean, this is so insane. 
45 megapixels and it'll shoot it at 20 frames a second. Like that's just <laughs> so ridiculous. I put the high speed on the other day just to see. I was shooting this little, um, this fishing derby. Uh, uh, kids down on the canal learning how to fish. They had them all spaced out, but I turned it on as like kids were casting, casting. And with no mirror and everything too, you barely even hear it. It's just like this that is so quiet and so fast. It's absolutely unbelievable. And maintaining autofocus, having a higher dynamic range, 45 megapixels, and then hitting 20 FPS. That's, that's not something I ever thought I would, I just didn't think that would ever be possible. Yeah. And the shutter sound thing, like you don't think it's a big deal because you're used to it, but like I shoot a lot of events and sometimes there's like something going on where a high frame rate is going to be super distracting. Um, you know, if it's like, let's you know, say when I'm doing something for victim's assistant, and someone's telling an emotional story, I'm not going to use a high, I'm going to pick the time when I could like take a photo, you know, to get that shot. So the, you know, one, the electronic shutter that the, R5 has is almost completely silent, but even the regular shutter, without that mirror flipping up and making all the, all that noise, I think people always um, have associated the noise a mirror makes with what a shutter sounds like, and really it, the mirror is what is so loud, because when you just hear the shutter on the R5, it's almost silent, then if you use the electronic shutter, it is silent, you don't hear anything. And there will be times when that is something that is um, needs to be used. Yeah, weddings, again, yeah. Perfect time where there's a moment going on where you don't want to make a bunch of noise. And I think we've all been around the photographers who are just like completely unconscious of it and are ripping off like high frame rates on a DSLR in a moment when it's like, uh, people are like talking about something so serious and you're like, they're like, <laughs> you know, it can be distracting. Same with flash. Like sometimes I know I could have a better shot with the flash and it's like, man, nail that flash shot and then turn it off for a while and bump up the ISO just to not be that distracting. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of situations too where I'm like, you know, it might be a little annoying now, but people want these photos. So the best quality is still worth going for. Um, so, uh, you have to, as a photographer, know sometimes when to, when is it important to, you know, be like, hey, do what you got to do. You know, get the shot. The shot matters. You're paid by the people who set this up to get these photos, so do it. But yes, I've finally gotten st started to figure out the R5. I really am starting to like it. Like I said, I'm blown away by the files right away, but I was frustrated with some of the functionality at first. But now I'm just realizing I really do need to set up those custom functions, like the. Um, where you have preset things. So I've got one now set up for when I do go to an event or when I want to shoot a portrait and it's just locking on the eye of the person instantly. And it's amazing. But to get it back to like simple one shot function was almost like the harder thing. Like me and Aaron went for a hike. Um, the photos came out beautiful, uh, not browser. Some of my things. The photos are beautiful, but yeah, at first figuring out the focus and just trying to get it to behave like a simple DSLR was driving me kind of crazy. Show me my folders. Yeah, this kind of thing, like where I'm looking through the viewfinder now, it's electronic, and I didn't know how to set it up at first, right? And I'm like, just, I wanted to focus where I wanted to focus, and I'd be so used to with my DSLRs just having it on the center focus focus point, like hitting that middle spot there, you know, 
don't mind if the grass in front goes out of focus, but want that like where the green path is to go in focus. And then the trees will be, you know, the, the way I would be shooting it. It was, I was making it just such a pain by using all the modern features. But then like something like this, where Aaron's walking down the path and the camera just tracks her. As much as she moves, as much as I want to do rule of thirds, have her in the center, the camera's just locked right on her. So it locks on her eye when she's looking at me, and then when she turns around, it'll lock on her face. And if it doesn't detect a face, it'll detect the body. It's just like, it is just there. I think I missed like one shot on focus when it was on this, you know, face detect tracking. But it was such a beautiful fall day. Yeah, and so of course the stream is probably only coming in at 1080 and on YouTube, but. Oh, why isn't this sharpening up? The detail this just pulls, and like I said, any blur is from this lens. It's not from, yeah, see the lens blur, but. And then what I could pull back is amazing too. So like here you could see like where the sun coming through the tree. So we could see where the shadow is. That was all like dark on the original file. And that's one of the main things with the R5 that isn't getting discussed enough. Like, yeah, they bumped up the resolution, 45 megapixels. That's great. I do studio work. I could use higher resolution. I'm one of those people who, you know, they put out the R6, that's 20 for people who don't need it. I like having the resolution. But the thing they're not talking about is like, they bumped up the dynamic range is something that Canon used to get so criticized for. Like you could tell this sky was originally blown out and this foreground was originally too dark and I could just pull back all that information. And I so much leeway with bumping up saturation, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, just absolutely, then the ability to crop in, because I think even on this, it was a much wider shot as I took it in the, the split second, but when you have 45 megapixels with a good lens, you have so much cropping ability. Yeah, like look at this, shooting into the sun, the sky is still blue, the foreground still has saturation and color. Yeah, to me, I think I actually have a before, and, what folder did I put a before and after into? I should show that because it is, It'll blow your mind to see like what kind of detail I could pull back. Yeah, it must be in here. No rating JPEG. Oh yeah, so like if you look at these two, there's a just save JPEG from the raw. Um, let's see, Otis, that's Otis, who's, that's his new bike shop, Dirty River, sitting in the front. And then the edited version Look at all that detail I could pull back in those condos behind him. Like, just make him look normal. And then, too, look how, well, you know, he's too dark and how I could just brighten up his shirt and everything. Like, that change. It's like, the building. How much saturation is still there, too? Because you used to try and bring back stuff, and then it was very washed out and never looked good. This is a lighting situation where you are always, like, you cheat it one way or the other, and you're just going to, you know, lose the background. But... Now it's there. I mean, it's really, it's really, really impressive. I did want to have, what was the other one at Bath that I really had a, um, there's one I did right at the end where they, it was so blown out and I could not believe what I brought back out of the trees. Oh yeah, this. So this image shot into the sun and I could see the sun like making those rays through the um, clouds. Like those trees were just, they're black straight off camera. They are just silhouetted. And same with that hill on the left side. And when you zoom in, I don't know, my loop will work now. See why is it showing all, this was happening to me earlier, it's not, I think my graphics card is failing me. Cause it's showing it all blocky for some reason. It's not getting to the resolution it should. Anyways, even at this size, you could still tell there was no detail, there was no color. And I think I used just a uh, gradient filter in Camera Raw and turned up the shadows on the bottom half of the image and there's color, there's detail. The other thing when you said you're a mirrorless hater, the other thing that takes 
a lot of getting used to, but is so cool is um, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're, it's, it's changing the exposure as you adjust the settings in real time because it's basically the rear panel of the camera. So, and with the uh, R5, um, what I've done, they have this control ring on the lenses. And so I have mine set to ISO. So you're just, so, you know, I've got my regular control shutter aperture doing that on the back. Then I could just hit ISO right here. The three things that I need to, you know, be quick about to get a good shot that I'm always changing. And, but you're seeing that. So as I change ISO, you know, on a traditional DSLR, it's just showing you what the light is with the aperture wide open. This is showing you what your exposure is. And I have a histogram in the viewfinder and an auto level. And it's just, yeah, all that detail right when I'm looking at it in real time is just amazing. The first couple times when I turn on the camera and point it at something, it would be so dis disorienting because it would be all blown out. I wouldn't really be seeing anything. Same thing, if you have it too dark, it's going to be all black, you know, which I guess could be a benefit or a negative, but once you're used to it, it becomes a huge benefit of actually seeing the exposure you're making. You know, it really limits how much I look at the back of the camera because I already know how I just exposed it because I'm looking at the histogram when I take the photo. And that's one thing I always use. I always trust the histogram because that's what I'm going to look at on my computer, my phone, everything. So no matter what the lighting situation is and how much my phone is compensating for something different, you know, I have that graph that is showing me what the light is doing and now it's in real time. It's, it's ridiculous. And then the other thing is I never thought I would care about a flip out screen and I'm already finding myself like holding the camera lower and looking into it or holding it higher or again, if you're going to take the selfie, like me and my girlfriend hanging out, you've got the, you've got it there. And then the touchscreen autofocus too. So it's like boop, boop, <laughs> all the settings. And then I do like the fact that since I ride my bike with my camera a lot, you flip the screen around. Oh, there we go. It's protected. It's not getting all rubbed up in my bag, which is another nice benefit. Yeah, it's amazing the form factor too. I mean, I don't, it really, they really did shrink it down without having to have that mirror box. I don't think I have another DS. Here's a 7D. But yeah, I mean, it's just considerably smaller than even the, um, let's hold them at the same, you know. Yeah, just such a, it's, it's pretty cool. They've, no one thought Canon would go all, all out and put all the stuff into a camera, and they really did. And then people are complaining about the video problems with the overheating. I don't, I don't have a computer that could run, that could shoot, this camera will shoot 8K raw. I don't have a computer that could play 8K raw, so that doesn't matter to me. Um, I shoot my YouTube videos in 1080, then export them in 4K, and it looks, they look beautiful. Now, even from the GoPro, so... Yeah, I mean, what everyone's told me is once you start using mirrorless, it'll be hard to go back to your DSLRs because you'll get so used to those, the benefits of the electronic viewfinder, what it can show you. I mean, I've already looked a little bit at focus peaking and the zebras for video and stuff like that, and it's just, it's pretty cool. Um, I think they probably could have implemented the autofocus in the DSLRs, but to be able to see it. The other thing I just realized, which will which will blow your mind is, so you could set the screen to be a touchpad. So instead of using the joystick to select a focus point, when I'm looking through the viewfinder, the screen won't be on, but I could just use my thumb and my focusing box will move wherever I push my thumb on the screen looking through the viewfinder. Um, I was doing that tonight and I'm just like, this is such a cool technology. And it's one of the things too where, you know, Sony's become pretty popular because they popularized mirrorless first, but Canon is already taken to the next level. Canon's in, you know, their intuitive menu systems and stuff like that make me glad I've stuck by them. But this new touch to focus feature is just amazing to just be holding it and have all this space. And you could actually specify 
how much of the screen you want to be active for your focus airing, uh, area. Me with you know bigger hands, I use the whole half of the screen, but you could set it just to be the top or the bottom or the full entire thing. I mean, this now they really, I know the joke used to be years ago, there are computers with lenses on them, but now this really is a computer with a lens on it. Um, and there's so many features I'll never even use the way I shoot, you know, I'll, you know, there's so much stuff that I could do with processing in camera and all that. You know, it's got all the interval on, um, velometers to do time lapses. You can now do double exposures, just, you know. Yeah, it didn't make, you know, the D DSLR is dead thing is probably true. I mean, they're always gonna live on. I'm using one right now and I'll continue to carry this as my B camera and my second camera on shoots. I even used it the other day for a video shoot that was just a, you know, interview type thing where someone's just sitting there and I'm like, I know how this camera works. I'm shooting in 1080. It doesn't matter. Like, I'm going to go with the safe camera. But, yeah, uh, five years, there are going to be very few DSLRs around and no one making them new, I don't think. It's just the technology is that much better with mirrorless. I never thought I'd give up on DSLRs either. But, well, should I... Uh, Yeah, I need to get the adapter. I can't wait to see what this what this camera looks like. Uh, well, not this camera, that camera. Looks like with a super sharp lens, like one of my 1.4 primes. Uh, my 105 Sigma 1.4 will be a great uh, camera to see, then get more direct comparison. I can already tell the dynamic range and the resolution, but I really want to see a sharp lens on it. Because even this, like these sun rays, I love to do that with the, um, whatever this is, F22. Uh, but that would look so much cooler on a prime. Yeah, look at those colors. I mean, it has so much detail all across. Yeah, it's interesting when it's interesting with mirrors because it was a slow change. You know, Sony was putting them out, but I didn't feel like the bodies felt like they were pro and the battery life was garbage and they just were lacking in so many areas. And even, you know, the new, what, A7 III, whatever they, the A7 III R, what I, I'm a Canon guy, I can't always remember Sony's lineup, where it's a, it's a, an amazing camera, but then I watch like YouTube videos of people being like, it's such a pain to deal with these menus and a lot of the stuff that Sony does where Canon just makes that, they just, they've had that nailed for so long, you know. Um, and I, when I upgraded, like I said, this is the ch biggest change I've ever had is trying to figure out some of these electronic features. But at least the menus still look like the menus. Like when I went to go on the Wi-Fi, it was still the same button, like, type stuff. The continuity is great. And also that camera has a whatever speed rating would be, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi transmitter. I used it yesterday. I was sitting at a brewery and I'm like, oh, I'll edit some of these photos. I'll send them over to my phone. Just now they're instant and they're, they come in clear instantly because I use the Wi-Fi function a lot um, when I'm traveling or whatever it may be. And with the 5D4, it'd be like, come on, I just want to see what this photo looks like. You know, it's like the blockiness, the pixelation slowly going away. And I noticed with the new one, it's just like, bam, bam, bam. They are just there. You could just see them clear. They download super fast over to the phone or transfer, whatever you would call it. Um, really, that's like one of those minor things that makes such a big deal when, or such a big difference when it's something you do often. You just want it to work and to be fast. It also pairs Bluetooth, so I don't know if that's if it's doing both, and that somehow helps. I'm definitely not an expert in that kind of nerdy stuff, but it is really cool feature. And then so also when you're controlling the camera with your phone, changing the settings and taking the photo from your phone, the latency is way uh, slower too with the 5D. You know, if I moved it, you know, you would then see it move a couple seconds or a second later. And now there's almost no latency with that with the new camera too, which is just a nice feature. Anyways, I think I am going to get going. Um, glad you uh, popped in, Ben. 
Oh, you've never tried out the Wi-Fi on your 5D? Oh, it's great. I mean, and then I use Lightroom on the phone, so I just edit it with the same kind of light editing I would. And again, that's what I'm saying, like histograms come into, you know, because your phone is not, it's changing with the lighting. But yeah, hey, you just pop them over. If you want a couple, even an Instagram story when you're, like when I'm out doing like a bike touring trip, why not use it from the good camera instead of, you know, just a phone photo if you could just pop it over from the Wi-Fi. Canon software is really good. The app is really great. Um, I use iPhones now, so it's really great for iOS. I have never used it on the Android version, but um, I would assume they were putting the same amount of effort into it. But it's a really good intuitive app. Um, so you basically choose whether you want to see the photos or you whether want to, or whether you want to control your camera. The controlling camera thing is great for when I'm setting up the studio, so I could have all the lights on and I could be standing in the center and I'm looking at my phone and I can make all the adjustments right there and I'm seeing what the camera is doing. And like I said, there's with the 5D4 there was some latency, but I haven't done that yet with the uh, new one in the studio. But I just from messing around with it yesterday, I know there won't be. So yeah, definitely if you use iPhones as well, definitely download the uh, camera app and try it out. Just I mean you. It's just fun to look at your phone and touch your phone screen, the autofocus to go and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, for transferring images over, if you're on the road, it's great. Um, you know, you're sitting at the bar, you're waiting for dinner, everyone's tired, no one's talking. That's when I fire it all up and start messing with it. Anyways, um, thanks everyone for joining um, another rambling live stream. And like I said, hopefully I'll see you on Thursday, but if that dinner runs late, I will see you next Tuesday.